Um, and now moving a bit more on to therapeutics, um, but therapeutics in the uh, everyday endoscopy space. So now we're talking about GI bleeding in the upper GI tract, who, when, and how. And we're going to mix the order up a bit from the program, and we'll just explain that in a short second. So the objectives of this session are to understand the issues with the management of gastrointestinal bleeding and how service level factors can improve them, master techniques for getting the correct diagnosis first time and during endoscopic examinations for GI bleeding, and acquire proficiency in various endoscopic modalities of bleeding control. But let's think about an algorithm. So here's our algorithm for GI bleeding. It's, as all good algorithms are, quite memorable. It starts with pretest and then it's ABC. Let's go into it in more detail. Let's start with pretest probability. The question is, what is the chance I will find something bleeding, that I will find a lesion? We'll go into what a lesion is in a minute. And what is the most likely diagnosis? So obviously you have the Glasgow Blatchford score, you have validated tools, which can tell you the chance of there being something bleeding. And of course, if the patient has cirrhosis, maybe they've got varices, et cetera, et cetera. This is all very obvious, but very badly done in my experience in practice. Also, of course, if you have a patient with a Glasgow Blatchford score of 10 and they are unstable and you find nothing, maybe you should spend some more time looking or consider very carefully that you have missed something. Whereas if you have a patient with a Glasgow Blatchford of 2 who is stable and you don't find anything, then maybe that is something with careful checking will go into that that you could accept. So let's start with the ABC. Active bleeding, A for active bleeding. So, of course... If you enter the stomach or the esophagus and there is red blood, it's blindingly obvious. If there is old blood, it's potentially a, a marker. And it's very important to note in your protocol and your report if there is no blood uh, in the esophagus. And then once you have, you have a suspicion of active bleeding, you should then try to find the causative blood vessel and characterize it. Excellent. Finally, then, uh, we come to this. Now, uh, um, I mean, uh, would you like to describe that to me, what, what you're seeing there in the context of a patient with cirrhosis? Well, I mean, I, I think it's, I would classify it as mild, mild to moderate. I mean, it's been treated before. We can, we can see some nodularity. I think that's from the, the underlying lesion itself and uh, as well from, from your previous banding, I, I, I would suggest. There does seem just in your frozen endoscopic image there a potential little nipple at yeah. about uh one o'clock or so I, I don't know what that is look, that. look yep so let's come back on it a little bit of peristalsis but the peristalsis maybe helps us here so have a look at that what is that do you think uh, yeah it's i i actually don't think that that's that's stigmata of recent uh of recent hemorrhage there also to be not, honest yeah uh, also not so John's uh, very uh, articulated very well the scale of the problem in the UK, but also what we've been doing to try and address this. And he's been the driving force behind these changes, the introduction of this bundle and package. And whilst you're doing that, I have a question online saying, any issues with pyloric stenosis if you're using the banda in this situation? It's a very topical question, isn't it, from what we're about to do. So I, want, I don't want to do anything myself here. I want to be talked through what I should do. So why don't I start with you, Steve? I'll just give you the overview here. So we've been talking, um, and I'll summarize our conversation, and you can give some nuances. We've been talking about how the technique, we'll talk about the, the way to actually do it in a minute, but just in terms of having a plan in our head about how we're going to do this. So we're going to um, potentially start here. We talked about proximity to the pylorus or not. That feeds into the person's question, I think, that's just been asked about, is that going to cause a pyloric stenosis or not? In my view, not. Um, then we talked about some sort of um, uh, kind of helical approach where we potentially banded this uh, zone, and then we maybe banded this zone, and then we would come back and think about the most, um, the, the reddest areas potentially, uh, proximally here. And one of them uh, you identified was this little, uh, what you called, I didn't call, a nipple. So maybe you'd like to take us further. And what, what were you, you kind of thinking whether we should treat this or not, right? Well, I was just struck by the fact that it's still there five months later. Mm. Um, you know, I, I can't remember if there was a massive drop in hemoglobin. I, I really do think it's just inflammation, just the healing process. But Would you ban uh, that now? Yeah, I... I I think I would. I don't think it's going to make it any worse. Okay. Uh, there is a question about it. I agree with everything you said in terms of uh, risk of pyloric stenosis. 
you are right, you probably need dedicated individuals who are highly trained to do it well mm -hmm. and organize the service around those people rather than having a current situation, which Ed Water alluded to, where everyone is expected to have a go, you know, share the pain of the on-call. Do you want to yeah, have a comment um, on that? Maybe, maybe it's not, the certification is not mandatory right now, but it's appropriate. So maybe we can create these kind of courses uh, mm -hmm. uh, after to have the certification and, and, and people can say, okay, I have at least I have this certification. So it's, it's to create, uh, it's a way to create a culture of doing not only for pleading for any kind of procedure, any kind of endoscopic procedure. So maybe it's the future. For